Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to RMIT. I'm Suzanne Davies, Director of RMIT Gallery. And before we begin any function in this institution, we acknowledge the significance of this land to our Aboriginal forebears. So in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that Story Hall, where we currently are, is located on the land for which the Rwandri and their forebears are the traditional people. And we recognise the cultural and historical significance of this land to these people. Tonight's 2015 Ursula Hoff Contemporary Lecture on the influence and legacies of 1980s German subculture is presented by RMIT Gallery, and I hope that many of you have had a chance to view the exhibition in the gallery in the actual story for the next door. We're in the annex at the moment. It's brought to you by RMIT Gallery, the Ursula Hoff Institute, and the SR Stoneman Foundation, as well as the RMIT EU Centre, the European Union Centre. And it coincides with the Goethe Institute's touring exhibition, Guignol de la Tonton, German subculture in the 1980s, and Spanish, our special edition, the Australian Ingenious Amateurs, all showing at RMIT Gallery. It opened on the 13th last week. And closing after White Night, when we're all totally exhausted, on the 27th of February. I'd like to welcome our, our panel of speakers. who are part of the German subculture as artists, as well as two local artists who were part of the Australian Ingenious <coughs> Amateur scene at the time. Welcome Matilda Vey. Matilda is sitting next to Jenny Watson. Curator of Dean Gideon de la Tonton. Musician Gotham Arbeit. And DJ Dr. Motta. <laughs> and our speakers from Australia, renowned visual artist Jenny Watson, from, who's flown in from Brisbane. Thank you, Jenny. Lower musician and sound designer Ash Wednesday, who of course performed with Anstor and Lloyd Barton, and our moderator, Dr. Stuart Grant. I'm delighted <laughs> to Stuart Grant. <laughs> Oh, chap at the end. <laughs> <laughs> we thank the Goethe Institute of Australia, the Ursula Hoff Institute, the SR Stoneman Foundation at the RMIT EU Centre. And we acknowledge the presence of Graham Riles AM and uh, Gummy Urban representing the Goethe Institute. I want to thank also, at the beginning, two volunteers who are working with the gallery tonight, Miranda Camboni and Georgina Liston. We rely on um, volunteer support, and we thank you very much that you're present this evening. A bit of housekeeping. The event will run for one hour and finish at 7, finish at 7 p.m. And we, we predict this, we usually deliver. It will be filmed up the back and will be available as a video on YouTube. So please now turn off your telephones. Read, check. Even if you keep going. <laughs> the other important thing to remember is that Yoko Arbeit and the band Automat will be playing at the John Curtin Hotel from 8 pm this evening. No. No? Later. Later? <laughs> what time? Five to eleven. <laughs> <laughs> On the dot. On the dot. Okay. Five to eleven. We'll hear more about this. The plan was. They changed the plan. The plan's changed. Yes. Um, it's a it's a Berlin post-industrial concert, and the admission charge is twenty dollars. It's my great pleasure to introduce Graham Riles, 
Chairman of the Ursula Hoff Institute. Graham, please. Good evening and welcome. Uh, I'm Chairman of the Ursula Hoff Institute, about which you may or may not have heard, but I'll tell you a bit at the end so you know how better it is. So you'll know how better it is. Tonight's lecture honours Dr. Ursula Hoff, AO, OBE, 1909-2005, to 2005, a refuge, refugee from Nazi Germany who arrived in Melbourne in 1939, sponsored by the then Women's College, the University of Melbourne, which is now University College. Dr. Hoff was born in London and was educated in Germany. She studied in Hamburg at the uh, Kloster School and then gained a practical application of technique by studying for a short time with a practicing artist before commencing her tertiary studies. After a year of studies spread between the University of Cologne, Frankfurt and Munich, she returned to Hamburg to continue her university studies. She left Hamburg in 1933 when Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany and introduced anti-Jewish measures. In 1934, as a British subject, she returned to Hamburg to complete her doctorate, which she did in 1935. In 1942, she was appointed assistant keeper of prints and drawings and later curator of prints and drawings at the National Gallery of Victoria, where she continued her career until retirement in 1974 as director. And then she became the advi <coughs> London advisor to the Felton Bequest until 1984. Dr. Hoff was also the first female lecturer appointed to the Department of Arts, Fine Arts, University of Melbourne. During her academic career, she published regularly in her field of 17th century Netherlandish painting, as well as promoting the work of Australian artists and printmakers. She founded the Print Council of Australia in Melbourne and was the first director. The impact of Dr. Hoff's scholarship, scientific training, publications, collecting and connoisseurship meant that her lecturing and judgments had much more wider repercussions than simply within a gallery setting. Inspired by the high intellectual standards of Dr. Hoff's research and scholarship, the Ursula Hoff Institute promotes and facilitates individuals and groups in the visual arts and music through annual lectures, scholarships, awards and grants. Tonight's 2015 Ursula Hoff Contemporary Lecture marks a changed direction for the Ursula Hoff Institute and is most fitting that its content comes from Dr. Hoff's homeland. And we're delighted that you are prepared to trust us <laughs> because you never really know what's going to happen. What the content was. I attended some of Dr. Hoff's lectures, and this is a little bit beyond her particular area of expertise. It's my, it's my great pleasure now to introduce Dr. Stuart Grubbins. Stuart is a senior lecturer at Monash University in the Centre for Theatre and Performance, where he specialises in performance phenomenology and ecological performance. He's also the senior guitarist with Noise Punk Legends, The Primitive Calculators, and a young Stuart Grunt features in the film Dogs in Space. Ah, that's okay. Dogs in Space screening in RMIT Gallery's Ingenious Amateurs Exhibition. Fronting the uh, Primitive Calculators playing and I have a quote here, pumping up in muscle. Yeah? That's right. I now hand over to Stuart, who will moderate the discussion. Stuart, thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Only the people that can't, can't hear you. Only the people that can't. Can any, all the people that can't, please let me know that they can't. <laughs> all right. Um, so, uh, We'll jump straight into it because we're behind schedule already, of course. Uh, just a few little notes. Um, I'll be asking each of the speakers a couple of questions, hopefully not too many, one, two or three questions, which will kind of wind them up and let them go. And after about seven or eight minutes, I'll shut them up and we'll go on to the next one. Uh, there might be a little bit of discussion. I might try and tease out a couple of themes from them or if they dry up, I might stand in front of them and talk. Um, but the, uh, we're just going to try and keep it so that we have these little vignettes. So rather than a lecture, it's like five little lecturettes. The running order um, will be 
First, Matilda Bay. Then we will hear from Dr. Mota. Then we will hear from Jochen Arbeit. And then Ash. And then Jenny Watson bringing up the rear. Before I start, just one little brief note that occurred to me today as somebody who was one of the main proponents of a very similar kind of scene to what we're talking about and what's portrayed in this exhibition that occurred in Melbourne at the same time and a little bit before, probably four or five years before the stuff that's downstairs. If you look at that exhibition and you look at what was happening in Melbourne a few years earlier, it was really brutal. It was brutal, it was angry and it was ugly and it was violent and it was nasty. We didn't perceive the world as a nice place. There was nothing pastoral. And, and that's what struck me. Why did this thing occur at the end of 1970s? That all of these young people all over the world got angry. And, uh, and it was just an interesting little pocket because really by the mid-1980s everything had turned into bland, big-shouldered slop. And, um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I just thought I would like to set that up as a possible theme for the night if anybody wants to address that as we go along. The fact of, in terms of it aesthetically, this whole movement was not nice. <laughs> um, so, to kick off, Matilda. Now, Matilda is the curator of the exhibition. Um, and so, well, the first thing I'll ask Matilda is, why? Why did you do this exhibition? I think it was three years ago. I have the feeling, or. Oh, I wanted to create an exhibition about crossover music and art and film. And uh, we decided to discuss why, no, about subcultures and to ask, does subcultures exist now? Or is it a big movement like in the 80s? And I remember the 80s because I made music too in that time. And we asked our colleagues worldwide of the Goethe Institute, is it interesting for you in, in your country uh, to show the, the, the 80s, uh, the, the subculture of the 80s in Germany? And now we have 30 museums They want to show it. Okay. And uh, it was just a feeling that it is perhaps the right time to show it now, okay, so to discuss it, was, it now. It wasn't a... a a major crusade or a big personal mission, just a whim. Uh, uh, you just did it for, uh, on an impulse. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay. So was it hard to get the material? Is it yes, sometimes, because many of the, we have many videos and music and photos, and uh, the license of many uh, uh, things, nobody knows who is the owner of the license, you understand? Mm -hmm. Yes, and therefore it was really uh, difficult. But all the bands I contact, they were very um, hilfreich. Or helpful. Helpful, helpful, helpful yeah. yes. Okay. Uh, you were a participant at the time, and you went back to it 30, 40, nearly 40 years, yes. the 30 years later. What? Was the, uh, what was that experience of going back and revisiting this period? Um, for me, it was really interesting to meet all the, the musicians and the artists I know from the 80s, but only from, from the radio or so on. Um, yes, it was, it was a Zeitreise, what is it called? Um, time travel. A time, yes, time travel. A time travel. Yes. And did, did it... Uh, did it change you? Did it change your opinion of what happened back then to be looking at it retrospectively? No, no. no? It was always in my mind, but um, no, it doesn't change, no. Okay. And so you said how many more countries is it going to? Uh, it, the first uh, opening was at Minsk in Belarus. Mm -hmm. Then it goes to Novosibirsk and then to Los Angeles and now to Australia and then it goes to Europe and in the USA and uh, Asia, yes, whole countries. Why do you think there is so much interest? I don't know. We, we don't want to, to bring it in, in the other countries, our subculture of the 80s, but we want the countries to create her subculture in this time. 
in that time or in another time. But we are interesting what uh, what was in that time uh, uh, in perhaps here in Australia. So it's a kind of curation as research, yes. where you take a curated object to another country in order to find out <coughs> what happened in that other country. Yes, yes. That's very interesting. And some, some people said, why do you bring it in a subculture to, to a museum? But I think today, the museum is not a place to only to look on, on, on pictures or such things, on art. Uh, it is a place to discuss things mm -hmm. like subcultures. Okay. Um, when you were a musician in the early 80s, were you angry? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't see you very angry. Could... Not really. <laughs> yeah, you don't look like I felt. Yeah. <laughs> what were your motives for playing this music? Pardon? What were your mm. motives? Why did you play this music in the 1980s? What were you trying to do with it? I like to, to make music and it was, it was a time, I'm not a, a professional musician mm -hmm. and it was a time we, could be, we have uh, electronic um, instruments and we can make music with, with the Casio and so on and it was just, uh, yeah, I like it. It's not a reason mm -hmm. that I was angry or such. Okay. And who did you play with and what sort of music was it? Electronic music. Mm -hmm. Synthesizers? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Like that? Nice. That's nice. That's nice. I'm still doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <Okay. laughs> Actually, I love it. Good. Well, um, I think we'll move on. Thank you, Matilda. Um, would you like to thank Matilda for this interview? Next on the list is uh, Dr. Mota, um, who's more well known for the music that he made later than for this period, I think. Uh, but he was lurking around having subtle influences in various bits and pieces before then. So what's your connection with the period of the exhibition? Well, um, I remember uh, being at that uh, one festival, um, the uh, Große uh, Untergangsshow in Tempodrom, September 4th, 81, and me being a punk at that time. Yeah? Because uh, a couple of years ago, a bit before, I was like uh, listening to friends and they what, what, what music they discover and, and discovering uh, John Peel's music and he was playing different music before that. I was a jazz music, uh, 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 listener, very much into jazz, yeah? and nothing else. So that, that changed something in, in the mu music experience with me, and then I went to that festival because we all went. So it was really good. And then as uh, 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 watching the Tödliche Doris, Wolfgang Müller, on stage playing a very bad piano, uh, 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 violin, very bad. He was like... He couldn't play. He, he couldn't play. It was like... No. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to it's myself, like I can do that too to my <laughs> Important theme for the night. I can do that too. Yeah, There's a big... <laughs> I was like, what is he angry about? So... <laughs> <laughs> And she was like uh, uh, singing about something I can't remember. Ich uh, bin schuld, du bist schuld. <laughs> das ist die Schuldstruktur. <laughs> I, 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 I. <laughs> I'm so, guilty and I'm guilty yeah. and this is the structure of guilt. Yeah. So, and then I, uh, we were drinking beer out of cans and I, I was saying, no, I want to play with and I wanted to try to... Uh, throw the can on, on, on the violin <laughs> and I hit it and I made a sound. <laughs> <laughs> so it was the first time I was playing uh, with uh, the Tödliche Doris. Later on, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> later on uh, um, I told Wolfgang Müller what I did 
and I didn't know because he was like decorated. Yeah, he was like uh, um, he had a, ma uh, a painting on the face, and like, he was like like was, an Indian, like kind an Indian of with thing. feathers and stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then I met him at a at a bar called or at a cafe called Mitropa, and I told him what I did, <laughs> and and he he told me it was me, and I was like I. I I immediately went uh, uh, red in my face, face yeah? I blushed <laughs> totally, and I goes, <laughs> yeah. so, but then he, he liked it very much and he uh, brought me over from the Mitropa to the uh, Risiko because it was uh, another place where we all met later on with all the gen uh, Geniale Dilettanten and um, all these underground subculture musicians. And then later on, he invited me to uh, make something very special because there was a concept of uh, being a foreign embodiment of the uh, Turkish Doris to have a gig playing at the SO36. Mm. And that happened. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I was uh, on stage as a bass player. Normally it was Klaus Uttermöllen. Okay, yeah? no. Niki. Uh, yeah, Niki Uttermöllen. Yeah? And, uh, they asked me if I can join because the concept was that, uh, that there will be uh, three f foreigners playing uh, instead of Turkish Doris embodiment, the foreign em embodiment. So they could actually, actually watch how it will be uh, if they look <laughs> on stage playing uh, uh, on stage when uh, Turkish Doris is playing. Yeah. Great idea. So there was a, so, and, I, and I was playing the bass. Yeah. Okay. So. At the end, yeah, I was part of the Turkish Doris. Yeah. So this celebration of uh, just get up and do it, whether you can do it or not, do it yourself. That's kind. Of, that's informed your work throughout, doing it yourself. The anti-virtuosity uh, and the use of technology in the making of music as an enabling thing of music, and you made that tra tra transition from punk through experimental to EDM. How did that happen? To what? To electronic dance music. Oh yeah, I, 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 okay. That, that's okay. Yeah. Because uh, um, you can understand EDM now very different. Yes. Very different because that's uh, monopolized by a, a company that is um, uh, um, they want to like to monopolize the whole uh, electronic dance music called SFX Entertainment. But that's another thing. Okay. Good. So this this what made you make that transition through these different styles? Ooh. That's a long story. Um, I try to make it short. Um, you got three minutes. <laughs> huh? You got three minutes. Three minutes. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, it's like um, I, I grew up with music. So and uh, my mother, in the age of 16, bought me uh, a drum kit. So I was playing drums. Then I got a, a purse and cushion drum synthesizer. And with this, you have two pads and you can play on. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And you also can like uh, trigger it by yourself. So you can uh, use, a, um, it can go into self oscillation to make some standing uh, sound, yeah? like mm -hmm. something like deep basses. So I was experimenting with that. Later on, I got a, a Korg MS-20 by my cousin. Uh, and then I was like just putting the, uh, headphones into the headphone jack and throwing me through the universe of sound and I was like experimenting all the time. Um, then I was playing in a band uh, that started on 90, around 1980 called Tote Piloten. There I was also like playing drums and a uh, little bit my trashy guitar um, and stuff like that. In 1985 um, uh, I got the uh, invitation to be a DJ in a small club in Kreuzberg. And um, yeah, a, a year later, mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, uh, starting with three other DJ, uh, with two other DJs, uh, Tobino Rosenheim, it's a small club in, in Schöneberg. So it was like a, a change from being uh, an artist uh, to be a, a DJ at the end. Yeah, so. And then uh, because uh, all these um, electronic equipment <laughs> went very cheap on the second-hand market and stuff like that. So I, I got uh, regular, I got more machines to, uh, f uh, like triggers for the MS-20, and I got a drum machine, and then I got a Uno 60, I got more machines and I got, got more and more and more. And at the end, uh, in 1992, I did my first solo album 
I had a DJ mixer. I had a TR909 by Roland. <laughs> I had a Uno 60, and I triggered the uh, Uno 60 with the rim, so I could like uh, had had the arpeggio going on, and uh, some other little machines. And I did an album <laughs> called Chill Out Planet Earth from 1992 mm -hmm. on Space uh, Teddy. Mm -hmm. So this is actually a very shortcut to okay. this thing. And so this uh, this is like a menu of. Uh, uh, an analog synthesizer enthusiast wet dream, just uh, all of those devices. Well, and, and they were all really revolutions in, uh, in the way you could make sound. But one more question, were you angry? No. <laughs> no? Why? Why, Why not? <laughs> Why? Why should I be angry? Because uh, I, I come um, from a culture that looks inside, because mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't want to be entertained. I can be very an angry on entertainment because I don't like that at all. I'm sorry. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Because when I play, I don't want to entertain you because uh, on my point of view, we should share. We should share and not being entertained. Yeah? I see my work as, a, as an artist and I offer something and, uh, to you. Yeah? And then I want to see how you deal with it. And that, that makes me, um, uh, or this is very, very interesting to me. Yeah? So as an uh, as a, uh, art concept, I like to throw something to you and then you have to deal with this. Mm -hmm. yeah? And um, because I like to have some beat where I can move my ass with, mm -hmm. and I play music to myself too, when I play as a DJ, then um, I know from that uh, experience I have that you will dance even better. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. <laughs> Next uh, cab off the rank is Jochen Arbeit, uh, who was a member of a band called Die Haut, and then he joined Einstein's from the Neubarten. And um, uh, he's playing in his band Automat tonight. Um, Jochen, were you angry? Well, that's a good <laughs> question. I think I was very angry, and I'm still very angry. <laughs> Just open uh, a newspaper, watch the news, and then you get very angry still. Né? Of course, there is some anger when you follow politics. Né? That mm -hmm. makes me angry still. Yeah, and, and was there a, a strong political element in the Berlin scene, either explicit or implicit? Um, uh, there was this, Berlin was the first target if there ever would be a confrontation between America and Russia. I think it would have taken 10 minutes for the Russians to come over and take the city. So we were constantly on the brink of, oh, they can come any minute. There could be an atomic war. Also, this was the 80s. So there was still this fear of uh, uh, destruction and uh, war coming over in, in no time. There was not even time to run away or something. So this makes a kind of feeling which is not nice. So an anger or fear or uncertainty comes from this knowledge that mm, it can be over any day. Mm. And this also, it, uh, this triggers something inside of you. I don't know, anger, mm, maybe, but there was some strange feeling in Berlin at the same that time. Something was wrong. Yeah, something wasn't right. <laughs> yeah, and were you a trained musician? Yes and no. I got some uh, music lessons as a kid because my, uh, the cousin of my mom was a music teacher, so all in the family had to go, so I learned a bit of organ, I learned a bit of guitar, but what we had to learn was so boring, uh, I, qu I quit after a while. Then I became a drummer as well, and I started uh, playing drums, and I had a fantastic music teacher in my school, middle school. He bought equipment for us kids, we could use uh, equipment, his equipment in the afternoons for a school band, and he. But the best thing was he hired buses. He put like 30, 40 people, and we went to concerts to other cities. We saw Frank Zappa, we saw Carlos Santana. So this is unthinkable nowadays to put all the kids in the, in the, in the first wars. They were older, they were smoking dope already. So he put all these kids in, in a bus, drove them to concerts, and drove them back at night. This <laughs> was fantastic, super. So uh, yeah, 
um, and uh, the best, uh, my best education was my older brother who was the first hippie DJ in town. He was DJing in the first LSD psychedelic club. So we had thousands of records at home. I was just looking at the covers. I was, I was fascinated by the covers and listened to the music as well. Mm -hmm. And with him also on TV in the 60s, the Stones were there, Beatles, everything. I saw everything as a kid. So at the time, with, with these pictures at this exhibition and uh, uh -huh. these bands oh, yeah. and all no, this I see them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's me over there. <laughs> <laughs> that's me there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. 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 Yeah, yeah. So I have this experience where I was part of, I had a few bands in Melbourne in the late 70s. And um, uh, I left Melbourne in 1982 and I came back in 2009. Okay. And in 2009, I was confronted with all these people wanting to talk to me about this supposedly exciting eruption of music and art that happened in Melbourne. And it was just bullshit. It, it never happened. It was a few people fumbling around not knowing what they were doing. Okay. Was it the same in, uh, in Berlin? Was, was there a sense, we are doing something important? Or did, was uh, the city electrified with the sound of your clanging metal? Uh, well, we were doing it for ourselves first, mm. and this was important, of course. And of course, we had the feeling that it means something to other people too, because we saw ourselves as a suburb of New York, for instance. We were close to connected to other people. Yeah, we had the feeling, I think there's a, a bit of arrogancy also there. Mm. Um, and I thought, yeah, we're doing something super important. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. For ourselves, definitely, and for other people, yes, I think too, yeah. Mm -hmm. and what do you think it was? Do, do you th you've mentioned the feeling of uncertainty. Mm. Uh, this, this position, this unstable position of Berlin, how much did it contribute to the actual character of the music? Well, we tried to, uh, to be as loud, as mean, as nasty as possible. Mm for reasons, hmm, I don't know, maybe it has to do with age, I guess, in the end. <laughs> well, yeah. When you're young, you want to, you're angry and you want to express it also. The, the anger has to come out as a kind of therapy for yourself, maybe. So we try to be really, like, bad, in a way, in the music, through the music and with the music. Okay. Thanks, would you thank Jochen Abba? Thank you. <laughs> Next, next is Ash Wednesday. I first saw Ash Wednesday, I think, playing with Bodan X uh, at a church in Carlton in 1977. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. You were there? I was there, yeah. Fantastic. I was the one down the front going, play faster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that was good. Uh, wow. Yeah. So, um, but Ash has an uh, illustrious career in Australia and he was also a member of... Uh, uh, Einstein's in the Neubarten for a decade or so as well. And so um, I'll just hand it over to Ash. Hello, Ash. Hello, Stuart. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm from my safety zone in Adelaide, Australia. I was angry as I was growing up. I was a revolutionary. I, 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 I rejected convention, the mindless establishment as I could see it, the mindless authority as I could see it. Um, my main form of escape from the boring grey matter world was, was music. Uh, and I was going to be a musician, there's no doubt about that, but I, I was going to teach myself, I was going to do it my way. I was a self-taught, self-styled musician. Um, I was, as I was growing up, I was very, I was, I was lured by the sounds that were coming from Germany. I love synthesizers. I love the new sounds. I love creativity. Do you, what period are you talking about? Are you talking about Can and Neu and Quasta and that? Yeah, I am. Yeah. I'm talking about, um, well, even, even Kraftwerk. Uh, mm -hmm. Autobahn, that would have mm -hmm. been about 1972 or something like that. Later. A bit later. Yeah. Round about that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, Mid okay. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't matter. So, I found, my, 
I found myself eventually cutting up pieces of magnetic audio tape and rearranging them and, and, mm -hmm. and trying to try to combine that with the, the anger I felt about the way media was controlling the society I was living in, which I rebelled against. Um, I was, at that point in time, setting up forms of sonic destruction as much as, as, much as creativity, and I combined that with um, a so-called punk group called Jab in <laughs> Adelaide in 1976. By the time we got to... Uh, there's Bodan there, right? that's Jab. That is Jab, yeah. That's who I saw at the church in Carlton. Indeed. Yeah. By the time we got to Melbourne, we, we you know, we, we, we looked and sounded like a, like a punk group, but originally we had formed in, Ad in Adelaide with two synthesizers and a, a drum machine. <coughs> and um, it was a brave new world instrumentally. But when Bodan found a guitar in a, in, a, in, a, in a rubbish bin, everything changed after that. <laughs> <laughs> what about this instrumental Brave New World? How important was that? And why, why did a certain portion of the punk music take up synthesizers like that? Um, that didn't happen until later. Um, but because synthesizers enabled people to instantly produce something. It's just all they had to do was press a key and turn a few knobs yeah. and it would create the most unexpected sound. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It was exciting. Mm. Um, people, that, people that were rebelling as such could make noise and a lot of nasty noise if they wanted to using a synthesizer very easily. They could they could blow up speaker boxes and amps and they could almost mm. cause physical damage with 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 with, 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 with pure noise. Mm. Um, I think that's a really important point that's really <laughs> underestimated in this. By 1978, punk had lost its intensity. It wasn't enough anymore. It wasn't feeding that rage. And, uh, and it split into two camps. Half of them became power pop groups and half <coughs> became a more primitive, savage, destructive kind of sound. Whereas I sat somewhere in the middle, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I, was, um, I, I, I tempered my, my sonic destruction tendencies. and I was fascinated by the, the new technology which was available to everybody. Little battery-powered synthesizers, battery-powered drum machines, which enabled people without technical ability to be able to create things, to be able to create melody, perhaps, certainly sound, and be able to express themselves in ways which were only dreamt of mm. previously. It was the future is here now. That's what I, that's what I loved about the technology of the 80s. And um, a number of a number of um, punk, had, punk had enabled anybody to get up and join a band. Didn't require technical prowess anymore, um, and that tradition was carried on, as you know, um, with what was called the little bands in in, in Melbourne, where. Um, non-musicians could get together with musicians and, and maybe rehearse, maybe not, just to form a group on the spot and to play in a live performance mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. And that was exciting. And there was, a, there, was a, there was an audience for that and there was a reason for that. But the, the reason for the little bands in my memory is <laughs> no one would play with the primitive calculators. So we got all our friends to make all these stupid little bands because we couldn't play with anyone else. And that's how it sort of came about initially, yeah. yeah. Dave Light and Lee Smith came one day and said, we've made a little band. And I said, let's all make little bands. Mm. Oh, <laughs> and uh, and they were disposable. And that's another thing exactly. about this yeah, aesthetic. Exactly. They had to be thrown away. It was disposable. Mm. When I look back on it, I realise what we were was kind of the end of the Fluxus movement. Mm. Okay. Um, mm. Yeah. yeah and, uh, anything else you'd like to say, Ash? Well, we... 
we, said, we certainly didn't have the, 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 the landscape of Berlin and Melbourne, but oh. um, we, we still had reason to be brutal, I believe, mm. and we, we had to, to fight against a, a, a conformist music industry that tried mm -hmm. to tell us, no, you can't do things like this. Um, we had to make our own records, we had to make our own cassette tapes perhaps, we'd do our own releases, we'd work out ways to do things which didn't involve thousands and thousands of dollars, which didn't involve those suicide <coughs> recording contracts, so that's a play on word. Um, um, so it was a, it, the, there was room for innovation and people responded and there was quite a, there was quite a, um, an alternative, alternative scene which was developing in, in Melbourne throughout the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, I saw, I, I experienced um, remnants of that in Berlin in, when I arrived there in 1992, except it was about 100 times bigger. Right. Things, things like Tacklers mm -hmm. were, 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 right. were, were hinted at. Huge hinted at here, mm -hmm. but yep. they, they were usually talked about more than actually put into action. Okay, and there, there was one little thing. Melbourne in the early 1970s, mm. there's a hidden history of Melbourne. Melbourne was an incredibly violent place. There were streets, there were fights on the streets of Melbourne outside Flinders Street Station. If you were a boy brought up in Melbourne in the 1970s, uh, in the outer suburbs particularly, you were inserted into a pecking order of violence and you were trained to be a soldier and they took away the war, the Vietnam War. And it was a very scary, violent place. And I think that that's something that really contributed to the, the way the Melbourne punk scene grew up. I don't know if that was the same. Did you have to go in the army in Germany? The point was, as a citizen of Berlin, Berlin was not part political-wise of Western Germany. It was still divided between Russian part, American part, French part, British part. So as a citizen of Berlin, you were not, they could not, they could not draft you into the, the army. So what you do, I, I come from West Germany, I'm, I'm not a Berliner. So with 18, they want to draft you. So what you do, you just move Pol to Berlin, become a citizen, <laughs> and then you got rid of the army. And this is what many young men my age, so a whole generation of young men came to Berlin, and then we were sitting in Berlin and saying, oh, what do we do now? Hmm. Let's make a band. <laughs> exactly. And that, yeah. that was it. Yeah. That's, that's a beautiful place to mm. cut to Jenny Watson. Jenny is... <laughs> <laughs> be understood that I might have been the first woman in the world to use confessional text before Tracy Emin. Tracy Emin has just bought a work of mine, so I actually see that as a validation that I was doing something interesting. Um, <clears throat> but uh, no, I was very, very angry. I was living in a <clears throat> small house uh, way outside of Melbourne. Uh, I could see that there was no connection between the Australian art scene and any sort of European art scene. And I felt something like complete despair. And I remember opening an American art forum and seeing a big ad for John michel Basquiat having a show with Warhol, a double page ad, and just thinking, 
Well, I will never have anything to do with that. Now, fate plays its hand. Five years later, I was sitting in the office of Anina Nose in New York, Basquiat's dealer, and she was saying, I will represent you in North America. <clears throat> so, I do believe in fate. I, I do believe that I was meant to meet Nick Cave. I do believe I was meant to go to Europe knowing nobody, getting a break, and then developing an international career. Have we got any more? The thing, oh, that's why back then, <laughs> I obviously wanted to be one of the boys in the band. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, the, the, that music scene in Melbourne really saved a lot of people, I think, because we'd all come from a very conservative post-war background where everybody lived in the suburbs. And a friend of mine, from not from Melbourne, just said, I, I can't believe the way the suburbs stretch from... Camberwell to Box Hill to Doncaster and forever <laughs> where you just saw these brick veneer houses with backyards and, um, and I came from there, I came from Box Hill <clears throat> and um, so there was, there was an anger and there was a desperate need to get out and in the early 80s Australian dealers had no aspirations that way, that came later, that came in the early 90s where every Australian dealer wanted to show at uh, Cologne Art Fair but um, Anyway, if we keep on with the images, um, <clears throat> I spent some time deconstructing painting. Have we got more? No, oh, that's it? Okay. <laughs> I spent a lot of time deconstructing painting and for people who know my work, um, I work on fabrics a lot. I use a lot of language. I use objects on shelves and um, I have a, a really nice international career now. But the anger of being a Melbourne girl and mm. wanting to get out same energy as the bands, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. So, mm -hmm. And when did you move to Berlin? Pardon? When did you move to Berlin? I didn't move to Berlin. Oh, right. No, no, no. I was only aware of what was going on in Berlin. Um, and I got my break in 1988 okay. um, when an Australian show went to Frankfurt and I got a one in a million chance of being offered a show by a, a Viennese dealer who had a, a gallery in Frankfurt as okay. well. Right. And, and everything was ready for me. It was like dominoes falling. Within 18 months, I was working with 10 galleries all over Europe, New York, Japan. Uh, I had to hire an assistant. Um, the whole world changed and it, it sort of kept on changing until the global financial crisis. <laughs> so now I, I actually live in Brisbane and teach in two um, universities, but that's fine. Um, but yeah, what okay. you're talking about, that anger, that milieu that said we don't want to be like our parents, was absolutely a, a plus in, in how my work It came from those backyards and <laughs> those streets. And yeah, 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 that's right. I want to thank Jenny, everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Now we've got about 10 minutes to throw open the floor. Uh, have we got a mic to go around for people to... This one here. Um, this one. To Just ask and answer questions. Uh, Are there any questions? Put your hand up uh, very strongly so that I can see. Yep. Berlin was obviously very special at that time as an island uh, with all the support it got from the government as well as no army and having an art scene and a cultural scene 24 hours open, uh, very different to the rest of Germany. Point, so 24 hours open, very important point. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that was important okay. for all the young people. So to me it, it was no surprise there was a subculture and, and uh, probably striving in the arts and the music if you compare that time, at that time when Berlin was an island, to today, uh, when everything opened and the great influx of the East and other countries, uh, how would you describe the subculture nowadays in Berlin? Uh, I so, think this goes for the Berliners, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like that. Uh, Berlin still is an island because there's nothing around Berlin. Yeah, because it's like. Uh, the place around, um, um, it's like Brandenburg, yeah, and uh, in the middle of Brandenburg there's Berlin, and there's hardly living anyone. Yeah? So it's like uh, you, you come to the city and uh, you have uh, 3.5 million people living there. Uh, nowadays um, it's like that um, because the wall came down and because there was a, uh, another city, so another part come, uh, was added to it, 
there was certainly uh, a lot of <coughs> empty places where you can go and just go in because there wasn't clear uh, who's the owner of, it, uh, of that and we were looking is there uh, energy can we plug something in and it can make some noise and dance to it and nowadays it's like that um, more and more people come to invest in property to get profit out of that. Mm. And this will damage uh, the free spaces where we can experiment for new things. And also what we have is uh, three, uh, 30 million uh, overnight Tours. stayers. Yeah. Yeah? It's like many, many, many people come uh, because of um, that vibe of Berlin, come off because uh, we, we, we did something in the 80s and we did something in the 90s because we had the love parade and it was really promoting young creative culture worldwide. And that uh, still is a, a reason why, why people come to Berlin and uh, look at the clubs, what's going on. But Berlin is not supporting it. It's more damaging as it because uh, more and more investors come to make pro profit out of properties. And what you see is like they raise up uh, ugly new buildings and um, well, that's not my city anymore. Yeah? Mm -hmm. On one hand, it, it's, uh, I, I love it, and on the other hand, I see uh, it's more damaged by profit, and this is not the focus. Uh, exactly, that had. happened in St Kilda. That was our little <laughs> Melbourne area, where there was yeah. cheap and old and beautiful, and that's yeah. a, a very high gentrified area now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and this, so this the, the money yeah. follows the punk, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's more like uh, in Berlin, it's like that. First, uh, we have the creative people, and uh, then the... Uh, area becomes hip and then the investors mm. come and destroy everything. Yeah, that's right. So if you see, it's, uh, especially um, Prenzlauer Berg, that, that Pankow, that was a district where all the artists were living during the German de democratic uh, area. And uh, nowadays it's only uh, sold uh, uh, flats and houses are built new and mm -hmm. uh, women with a kinder, uh, Kinderwagen and stuff like, stuff like that. So, so it's, really uh, in, uh, not interesting any, anymore because there's no neighborhood anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the clubs are gone in this yeah, area. Not, exactly. Yeah. No nightlife, that's for sure. Well, I think there's still an underground, but you have to really look for it. If you're still 25 young, uh, years young, and uh, you really go for it, I think it's definitely must be there, and I'm sure it is. But I'm not looking for it anymore because I don't go out anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I know it's there. This is the only thing you have to know. It's there. You could, if you want to, you find these places. Sometimes I sneak in for, uh, I don't know what reason, sometimes. not. <laughs> but you know it like the back of your hand, Jock, and you just take it for granted. But for somebody from outside, there's not so many rules and regulations like you were telling me about before. All the rules and regulations you're, you're, ex you're experiencing here in... Here, yeah. he, here in Australia, and I, I, would, okay. I, would, I would describe Berlin as almost being like the last bastion of freedom in the, in the, in the Western mm. world. Yeah, but Kilda this is uh, would, going so. down also. Yeah, I know it's going down, like, like the rest, yeah, yeah, sure. It's not so interesting as it was. <laughs> oh, no, of but course Kilda, not. I think it's it's to say something here. But perhaps we can discuss if it is possible to have such a, 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 a big movement like in the 80s, in the time of digital revolution and internet and so on? I well, don't think so. Take long, there are I many, guess, so. many uh, uh, yeah. small subcultures, but not, mm. not one bigger movement, I think. Fragmentation into multiple subcultures. Yes. Uh, we, we should move on to another question to see, yeah? Sorry, I was brought up in Glasgow where we had the Fastlane nuclear base. So in the 70s, it really was like the end of the world was about to happen. Do okay. you think in Britain, you know, it's, it was, I can only really speak for Glasgow, but you know, you got this industrial music, which was a, was a, a sense of the life. life, sorry, the life that we were living, the sense of, a, you know, the world was about to end through uh, nuclear fallout. Did you get that in Australia, Stuart? Because I... Absolutely. I, did. We were all scared that the world was going to end. Yeah, but I see the 1960s and 70s. Got it years later, you know yeah. what I mean? No, we, I grew up in the shadow of the bomb. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. Huge influence. Two mm. big influences on my childhood, the bomb and Vietnam. Mm. Yeah. No. Yeah. Mm. There's another right. question back there. Sure. Well, this guy. I've got a question for 
shoe. Oh. Um, oh no, 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 you sorry, the one in the black jacket. Yeah. Ash. Oh, Ash. Sorry, Ash. Yeah. Sorry, Ash. Yeah. Um, being in the punk scene in the eighties, I just wanted to know. I've got a fascination with with Footscray. With Footscray. Do you, were you around in Footscray when the subculture was happening in Footscray in the 80s with all the abandoned warehouses and all the parties and all the stuff that used to go on in no, the not punk so, scene in Footscray? Not so much. I were, uh, um, by that stage, I was, I was into a different world and um, I had my own, my own studio happening and uh, right in the middle of, of Fitzroy. Oh, okay. In Brunswick Street, I, I I vaguely knew about Footscray, but I, I I wasn't that I wasn't familiar with with the next wave of punk. I I sort of lost lost interest by that stage. There's a cultural gulf that happens around 1980, where up until 1980 the Melbourne punk scene existed first in St Kilda, and then some of us moved to Fitzroy, and uh, that was the Melbourne punk scene. It had two parts, and then. It spread very quickly out into the suburbs in, in the early 80s, but Footscray was like, uh, it might as well have been the moon to the, Mel to the original Melbourne punk scene. Okay. Yeah. I just thought Footscray had a big subculture thing in the early 80s. That's a bit later, yeah, 82, 83, I oh, think. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? We've got time quickly for one more. Yeah. Is it Um, you touched on the fragmentation of music at, at the moment. I, I just sometimes find the actual volume of music and the accessibility of it completely overwhelming compared to what it was like in the 1980s where, you know, there was a limited number of genres that you could actually sort of listen to and access. And I just wondered if you did find the modern day volume of music and its accessibility overwhelming like I do. Yeah, I cannot follow it anymore because there's too much going on and most of it is so boring, uh, so I stop. Are you, when you say volume, are you talking about genres? Are you talking about genres? <laughs> different genres? Yeah, I mean... And accessibility as well. Accessibility, yeah. Yeah, it, it is overwhelming and, and back in the day, well, retrospectively people talk about the music I was playing in the 80s as being Australian minimal wave. And we didn't call it anything at all, you know? I mean, it wasn't fashionable to, des to describe music. The, the whole point of music was to go beyond words. And so, so this, 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 this influx of genres is um, very important to the, to, to the digital age, certainly. Because if you don't sound like something, you don't actually exist. But it helps finding your way through the overwhelming volume. Okay. Uh, what I uh, like to focus is also uh, nowadays it's like that um, hardly any people buy music anymore because uh, nowadays in the digital age uh, more and more companies uh, like to earn money on streaming music and not mm -hmm. paying the artist. Mm -hmm. And this one that's, I don't like at all. That's right. Because uh, anyone else is earning money but not the artist. Yeah. And nowadays the artist is more like a. a a singer in the mid, mid age, uh, in the, in the middle age, uh, long time, long time ago, he is now singing for money and not earning money anymore because anyone else is uh, uh, getting profit out of his uh, stock market and stuff like that. But the artists, at the end, they have to go and play and play and play and play and not having um, business out of that. Yeah, but anyone else like the distributors. Uh, uh, shops, uh, digital download shops, and streamers like uh, Spotify is on, on at these words and stuff like that. And then I also hear, hear stories that uh, movie makers use uh, music without uh, paying money for that. Why? Why this? This is not fair. That's not good. That's not fair. <laughs> and we should uh, think about uh, not using stream music. We should actually buy music. And if you can, vinyl. Or something like that, yeah. <laughs> because uh, uh, bodyless music, this is this all looks like this, yeah. And I don't like that because I like to have a cover with it. And you should hold me in my in your hand and stuff like that. This there, one. There's like just. That. It's it's a, <laughs> uh, that, that can make me angry, yeah? and, and even like what we did in uh, 2012, we were, we were fighting against uh, uh, gay, 
GEMA in Germany, that's a copyright uh, collection uh, association, and uh, they like to earn money from anyone else, but not giving money uh, uh, to, to the artists, uh, to the uh, main artists, because they are 95% uh, of all members of the GEMA don't earn money. And so... And this is like really bad. To and, and not, not even can vote and stuff like that. So this is a bad situation. Mm. And now we also have a new law. They uh, like to discuss uh, with uh, set up institutions like the GEMA and uh, there's a, uh, um, a, uh, an, an alternative coming up called C3S and they want to be a fair copyright collection association and uh, this new law will fight against this new association and this is what I also don't like. So we have to force <laughs> the right of the uh, artist and not the fight, uh, and, and not the for, um, situation or the um, support of the association they collect money for artists and this is not well, this is all not well. So this is a thing what uh, I uh, see now, we have to uh, come together and uh, create something new uh, and also like you all, you um, have to uh, think about how to support artists by buying their music or art. And so I would uh, leave us with the question that why is it, if this is the case, that Melbourne at the moment has, I've, I have absolutely no doubt, and like I'm not a big fan of Melbourne, I hate the joint, but it right now absolutely un, unequivocally has the most exciting music scene it's ever had. There are more bands playing more music with more people and more audiences and more events than ever in the history of this place. And uh, unfortunately we can't discuss that, but I, I like to end with a question because <laughs> answers are useless. Um, so um, I'd like to thank the panellists. Would you please come <laughs> And uh, I'd also like to thank the Goethe Institute and uh, RMIT and uh, mostly thank you for coming. Thank you. Mm -hmm.